Hey Elnas, thanks for being here for your first English lesson using distance learning in technology, I guess. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today has to do with our weekly topic, which is mental health. And we are gonna cover a really interesting topic that I'm excited to talk about, that I will talk about in about five minutes. But the first thing that I wanna do is start with a writing prompt. So just like I had been doing with my amazing third hour class, we are gonna do a very brief writing prompt. Obviously, I won't know if you do it or not, but I hope that you do it because it's always great to start your English lesson with a little bit of writing, a little bit of free writing, to give you the opportunity to get some ideas down on paper before we even start talking. So I'm gonna do it with you. The writing prompt is gonna last five minutes, and we're just gonna spend five minutes writing on this question. The question for our mental health week is, what are your coping mechanisms, both healthy and unhealthy, and both conscious and unconscious? So how do you cope with things? How do you cope with stress? How do you cope with disappointment? How do you cope with too much stimulation? So what are your coping mechanisms, both healthy and unhealthy, and both conscious and unconscious?
Okay, nice job with the writing prompt, everybody. I hope you had a good five minutes of just solid get some ideas down on paper. Because like I said, it's really good for your brain. It's really good for your writing practice. And it's just a good way to start off your Monday. So let's go ahead and get to the lesson today. We're going to do a combination of sort of this like weird direct lecturing via camera thing that I got going on here. But most of what I'm going to be doing is going to be on a PowerPoint. So I'll be screencasting a little bit back and forth with a little bit of commentary here. So stop and occasionally telling my dog to stop growling at things. Okay, cool. So, so as you know, our topic for the week is mental health. And being the English teacher, I wanted to find some kind of connection between mental health and literature. There's a ton of different directions that you can go with these two topics, but I found an interesting connection that I wanted to explore a little bit deeper that we're gonna focus on today. And that is the connection between mental illness, and some of the most famous pieces of art and literature in the Western world. So we, in our culture, we have some pieces of art or pieces of literature that are considered to be masterpieces. So these are things that you would definitely recognize if I put them in front of you. Um, and we hold them up as examples of our culture at its best. But oftentimes the story behind these pieces involves mental illness. The person who created that art was suffering from mental illness when they created it. But that's rarely a part of the story of that art or that novel. So we either ignore the mental illness, pretend like it wasn't happening, deny its role in creating the masterpiece, or sometimes we even make it a joke. And so we have this very strange thing that happens in our culture where we stigmatize mental illness, we say it's a personal problem, or it's not that big a deal, or it's something that, you know, you need to get over, when in reality, we praise work that comes from artists who are experiencing and dealing with mental illness. And some of these are like the most famous paintings, the most famous books ever written in our culture. And so we need to recognize that this juxtaposition, this, this uh, discomfort is happening so that we can call it out when we see it. And let's look at some examples so that this starts to become clear what I'm talking about. All right, so before we start to um, look at some examples, let's revisit this claim. So our claim is even though mental illness is stigmatized, meaning it is something that we um, see as disgraceful as a society, we still praise works from artists experiencing mental illness as masterpieces. This does nothing to improve our societal understanding of mental illness. So there's this disconnect. We like to say how much we love these works. They're masterpieces. They're the best things that people can create. But we also have a tendency of uh, denying that mental illness played a role in creating these masterpieces. And so no one really benefits from these kinds of situations. There's no better understanding. There's no better awareness or notoriety brought to this topic. So let's go ahead and look at some of these famous creators who were uh, experiencing mental illness in their work. So the first person that we can talk about is Van Gogh. I know some people say Van Gogh, but I'm just going to go ahead and say Van Gogh. So Van Gogh was a prolific painter, but he was not well known in his time. Now, however, Van Gogh is considered to be the greatest impressionist painter of all time. His mental illness usually plays the role of a joke. You know, we'll talk about that later. Um, Van Gogh was very well known for his landscapes um, and uh, these beautiful still lifes that you see, you know, the cool use of line and strokes. The paint strokes are very unique and his use of color as well. Um, and he made lots of very interesting self-portraits as well. He's probably best known for this work, which is titled Starry Night. It was painted in 1889 when he was in the saint Remy Asylum after a mental breakdown. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is considered to be one of the greatest paintings that has ever been made. And so we have that background and that notoriety for Van Gogh. 
So Van Gogh was no stranger to mental breaks. He was plagued by mental illness for most of his life with what we now understand to be manic depression or bipolar disorder. So that disorder was very misunderstood when Van Gogh was alive. And he was treated for all kinds of illnesses, you know, trying to trying to get better from that. So that included treatment for epilepsy. He once hopefully wrote to a friend, I well know that one could break one's arms and legs before and that then afterwards that could get better. But I didn't know that one could break one's brain and that afterwards that got better too. So we see these high and low points in Van Gogh's life and we see that expressed through some of his art here. In 1888, Van Gogh had a serious mental break and during this break, he cut off his right ear. So this fact about him has become infamous. And you remember when I was talking about joking earlier, this has sort of been this running joke, despite it being obviously one of Van Gogh's lowest points in his life. And so Van Gogh is very well known now as just being the guy who cut his ear off, despite this being a serious mental break. So after this time, uh, Van Gogh moved into an asylum and tried to begin a healing process. While he was there, I mean, this is him being an amazing painter, he completed over 150 works just in the year that he was there, including the two that you see right here in front of you. It was after leaving the institution and a year and a half after cutting off his ear in 1888 that Van Gogh ultimately committed suicide. In one of his last letters, Van Gogh says, if I could have worked without this accursed disease, what things I might have done. When we think about Van Gogh, oftentimes his complex mental illness is reduced to a joke about cutting off his ear. And rarely do we hear about his complex reality of a life full of beauty, inspiration, talent, and this struggle with mental illness. And what's interesting is if we look back at Starry Night, you know, knowing what we know now, maybe there's a little bit more that you understand about it or you look at it in a slightly different way. But um, one interesting thing that comes up is this theory that um, because of his treatment for epilepsy, he was taking something called digitalis, which is a uh, foxglove. And people who consume a lot of this um, start to see a yellow tint in their vision. And so uh, they get haziness in their vision and there's sort of this yellow tinge to everything they see. So it's possible that that influenced the work of Starry Night, you know, his most famous painting. But it's interesting too, that we look at Van Gogh's work and we see him as one of the most important painters of all time. And yet his mental illness is so often reduced to just a joke. So let's take a look at another example. This one's going to be a little quicker. This is a guy named Edvard Munch, who was a Norwegian painter at the end of the 1800s. He moved from Norway to Germany, and that's where he spent most of his time was in Germany. Um, Edvard Munch suffered from anxiety through his whole life and vivid hallucinations. There's a lot of people that now think that he probably experienced schizophrenia uh, as, a, as an adult. And um, as a result of these, these hallucinations, which he said haunted him, he took up alcohol as a coping mechanism to try to deal with things. Um, through his artwork, we see a lot of his expression of his mental illness, including his most famous work here, which you see, it's called The Scream. And this was painted in 1893. Now, what's interesting about the scream is that it is absolutely memorable. You know, you see it and you're like, oh, I've seen that before. Absolutely. But there's very few people that look at it and know that the inspiration behind it actually came from Monk's mental illness. And this is part of the problem that we see, right? We're holding these important works up without knowing that actually this came from a place of mental illness. And that adds to the conversation about what mental illness can be. So we look at uh, the inspiration for this piece. The inspiration for the painting um, came from him going on an evening walk and he had this hallucination. He said the sky began to turn blood red and he was trembling with anxiety as he felt an infinite scream through nature. And sorry, that's my dog if you heard that. 
So this infinite scream is what we see here on the canvas, which of course has been taken and turned into everything from a Halloween mask to a joke on a commercial. If we look at his other pieces, it just gives us a little bit of a more uh, complex picture of who Edvard Munch was. The picture on the left is a self-portrait. He called it Self-Portrait in Hell. The pi uh, picture on the right is titled Anxiety. So just two more pieces from this very prolific painter so that you don't just have one painting that you associate with him. So a quote here from Edvard Munch was, I cannot get rid of my illnesses, for there is a lot in my art that exists only because of them. So some other artists whose uh, work we can point to when we talk about the intersections of mental illness and creativity, we can look at artists like uh, Louis Wayne here on the right, who um, at an early point in his life started painting these very funny anthropomorphic looking cats. And he said it made his wife really happy. Um, when his wife died at an early age, he went into a deep depression and his cats took on a more and more uh, psychedelic flair. And so by later in his life, when he was um, experiencing extreme depression, he started creating these very psychedelic looking cats, which is pretty cool. And you also have Sam Gilliam, who's a mixed media artist who uses the uh, uses color and cloth to um, obviously make these really cool looking sculptural pieces. Who's um, starting in the 1970s and 80s has been very open about his struggles with um, addiction and with depression. Now, this reality is not limited to the world of art. If we talk about some of Western literature's most famous and revered authors, we see a very similar pattern. The first person that we're gonna talk about is Ernest Hemingway, and how his life shows something very similar to the way that Van Gogh and Edvard Munch were treated. If we wanna continue this conversation into the world of literature, a really good example of the same sorts of things is uh, Ernest Hemingway. So Hemingway is widely considered to be one of the greatest writers of all time. He's also notorious for his drinking and his partying and his ever-changing series of wives. He had four or five wives. Even to this day, few Hemingway fans are able to be open about the depth of Hemingway's depression and his uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenic tendencies. So What's interesting to note too about Hemingway is that he ex achieved extreme success at a very young age and then spent a good deal of the rest of his life trying to, um, trying to earn that success again. So in other words, he was the best journalist and the best novelist ooh, and a terrific writer all by his 20s and he developed this sort of competitive streak that made him seriously unhappy. He was notorious for being unable to ever praise another writer, but he also felt like nobody was as good enough a writer as he was. And so he, he had these very high standards that creating this very created this very suffocating anxiety and this desire to sort of recapture what he had in his 20s his entire life. Um, you know, his very notorious coping mechanism was alcohol. He's very well known for his drinking habits and his, his partying habits. And he did have a very interesting life. He lived all over the world. He met all kinds of fascinating people. He lived in Cuba for a long time, uh, lived in Montana, fought in World War I, um, just, uh, you know, lived in Spain for a really long time. A really fascinating life. And so often his fans loved to talk about how he was such an interesting guy and how much of a great drinker and what a, what a good time he always had. Of course, you know, we also need to mention the flip side of this, that the alcohol was absolutely a coping mechanism for him. And it's, uh, it's doing him a slight disservice to his legacy if we don't mention that, you know, yeah, he was a big drinker, he was a big partier, but he was also suffering um, quite a quite a lot of, uh, of issues that came from his mental illnesses. If we look at his work, 
his creative writing also seems like it was, it was a, a way to cope with or a way to help him understand what was going on in his head and in his heart. So in other words, uh, he told certain stories to sort of ease these aches that life had started inside of him. In a Farewell to Arms, one of his most famous books, Hemingway tells the story of this young American man named Frederick Henry who's wounded in the leg while serving in World War I, and then he falls in love with this uh, American Red Cross nurse while he's in the hospital. It turns out that Hemingway's experience was very similar. He was wounded in the same place, wounded in the leg, in the same geographical location while he served as an ambulance driver on the Italian front. And he also fell in love with an American nurse and they, they had a love affair. Um, and so his, his work echoed his life in many ways. And we can almost look to that with the story of the old man in the sea, which did win a Pulitzer prize in 1953. Um, the old man in the sea tells the story of this fisherman who's had a series of bad luck, you know, dry spell, and it brings him lots of uh, disdain from the people that live with him in his village. So he goes out and he says, I'm going to catch a marlin, which is going to break this curse and I'll catch it at any cost to try to regain my former glory. And a lot of people point to that and say this was him trying to express how unhappy he was at the end of his life and how deeply um, unsatisfied he was, and how affected he was by his depression and anxiety. Um, after The Old Man in the Sea in 1953, he also won a Nobel Prize in literature, but he was also in serious mental trouble. Um, he started to have these very uh, paranoid fits where he would call his friends and say the FBI was following him. Um, he wrote a letter to his friend Hotchner and he said, I'll tell you Hotch, it is like being in a Kafka nightmare. I act cheerful like always, but I'm not. I'm bone tired and very beat up emotionally. And so again, he began to worry that his friends were plotting against him and that the FBI was monitoring him. And, you know, his fans really like to focus on how much fun he was and how much he drank and, you know, his, his, uh, his love affairs that he had and his legendary life. Um, but by uh, ignoring this real struggle with mental illness, you know, it's only part of his story. And it also limits us and limits our understanding of the role that mental illness can play in the creative process. Even great American authors like Mark Twain struggled with depression. Um, for a long time in his life, he experienced a lot of loss, and that led to heavy depression in the later part of his life. And yet, so many of us just know him as the author of these great American stories, and that part of his life is really left out. There are so many other authors that we could talk about. I'm just going to name four of them. We've got someone like Sylvia Plath, amazing poet and confessional artist, who really brought her experiences with depression to her craft directly, like sort of writing very openly and honestly about her struggles with depression. We've also got Isabel Allende. We've got, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget his name again. I just. I just, this is this guy. He's a guy. He wrote Pet Cemetery. He wrote, I've got it in my notes. Oh my gosh. I always forget your name. I'm so sorry, dude. Oh, Stephen King. That's his name. So we've got Stephen King, and we also have Maya Angelou. So these uh, great artists from the latter half, the last half of the of the 20th century, um, Isabel Allende writing about how the death of her daughter affected her very um, openly, and and Stephen King and uh, Maya Angelou, known for their advocacy for mental health. So what's interesting about the last four authors that I mentioned is not only are they all from the 20th century, so they're all from the 1900s, but they're also, most of them are very outspoken about their own struggles with mental health. Especially, you know, Stephen King has always talked about how he developed alcoholism and drug addiction as a way of improperly coping with his depression and anxiety. And you also have um, you also have people 
like uh, Maya Angelou, who has always talked about trauma in her early life and how she's had to deal with that as an adult um, and how it led to her lifelong struggles with anxiety and feelings of self-worth. So again, what's starting to change here? People are starting to be more open about it. It's not becoming such a you need to keep it to yourself kind of thing. You've got more and more authors that are being very open and upfront with how mental health has affected their craft. One more example of this is J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series. So J.K. Rowling is a really interesting case of a modern author who has dealt with a lot of um, issues around anxiety and depression. J.K. Rowling, of course, is very famous for writing the Harry Potter series, but when she was writing Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, she was uh, at a very rough time in her life. She had recently been divorced. She had a young child. She felt she wasn't being a good mother for. Um, she was in a place where she was not making very much money. She was almost broke. She was living in poverty. And so she talks about those times and what she was going through mentally at those times very often, very openly with her fans. So she's very transparent about the ways that depression manifested itself in her work, including if you've read uh, book number three, The Prisoner of Azkaban, it talks about this series of characters called the Dementors. And the Dementors are these uh, roaming hooded black figures that suck all the happiness and joy out of the living things in the room. And she said that the Dementors were meant to be a literal manifestation of depression and how she felt in her depression. So it's little things like that that J.K. Rowling, uh, as well as the, you know, the tweet below that you can see there, the outreach to her fans are ways that she says she wants to be very open uh, with the world about what depression is like. We could easily extend this conversation into the world of theater and movie actors as well as musicians. I bet each and every person who's watching this lesson could name someone that they know who is famous, who's very open and honest about their struggles with mental illness. And so that kind of increased visibility and increased understanding I want to kind of leave it up to you to decide where that comes from and what the possible uh, outcomes of that increased openness and visibility are. All right, way to go. You made it to the end of the lesson. I'm going to give you three options for your assignment. You can pick whichever one you'd prefer, completely up to you, and it's going to be due next Monday, the 27th. The sooner you get it done, the sooner you turn it in, you don't have to worry about it. So go ahead and get it done at your own pace. Just know that it is due Monday, the 27th. Okay, so we're done, right? The lesson is over. Show me that you understood at least a facet of it by completing one of these three options, all right? Option A is a direct response. So look back at Edvard Munch's paintings titled Self-Portrait in Hell and Anxiety. Why do you think he chose those titles and how does the work reflect those titles? Well, that's option A, five sentences at least on that question. B is a written or a verbal response. So if you wanna record yourself answering this question, then send it to me, that'll totally work. Otherwise, writing it like normal works just as well too. So do you believe things are changing when it comes to how we address mental health on a cultural level? Why or why not? At least five sentences on that question. And then C is a research response. So headed in a different direction. Look up one of the famous artists or authors from today's lesson or find a new artist, singer or actor, so somebody that wasn't mentioned in the presentation, and briefly report on how mental illness has affected their life and work. Okay, those are your three options. There's a bonus option here as well if you would like to um, either send me a little bit or send me a reflection of your five-minute warm-up today for just a just little bonusy points. You can totally, totally optional, but I'd love to hear what you what you were writing about as far as your coping mechanisms. So all you got to do is A or B or C at least five sentences. At least five sentences. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe in every one of you. I miss you so incredibly much. And 
I hope to see you all very soon. Be well, everybody.